Perfect. All right, Dr. Mike, thank you very much for being here. If whoever's watching this doesn't know Dr. Mike, just go and look him up on YouTube. Dr. Mike Isretel, RP Strength, just the RP app. There's so much, you know, we've talked about this stuff and you have a lot of content out there that can explain who you are. And I just want to get down directly into it. The reason why I called you over was nutrition today. Um, we had um, a talk about, you know, biomechanics and performance and all these things about sports, but I wanted to talk to you about nutrition. So real quick, I know you have the RP diet app and people can download the RP diet app so that I want to pre-frame it to what that is. First of all, you can tell us what that is first to pre-frame so that people can, as they listen to this, they can go on and download it and see it. What is the RP diet app um, on its own? Yeah, so it's a diet app like many others, but the big difference is that it actually splits your day into meals and it has meal reminders. So if you're one of these people that's like, okay, I know nutrition is important and I generally like have experience eating healthy. I know what kind of foods are good for me, generally what kind of bad, but I get just, I don't, I tried to look up how much I should be eating. Is it four meals? Is it six? What time do I eat my meals? What should be in my meals? The RP diet app will just kind of tell you when to do that stuff. Now you get to choose what foods you eat, but it tells you for every meal, how much of each food to eat, the exact measured quantities. You don't have to do macro math anymore. And you just follow the plan. You tell it your goals. You say, I want to lose 15 pounds in the next three months. And it goes, okay. And it'll change your diet for you automatically every single week. Cause a lot of times it's really tough without a coach. So the, the RP diet app is actually called the RP diet coach app. Is it functions like a digital coach. It reminds you when to eat. You have some say in what you eat, but then once you tell it what to eat, it reminds you to eat that. It uh, picks how many meals a day you're eating. It tells you when to eat. And then it also modifies your intake based on weekly progress. So for example, if you're losing weight at a certain pace, do you cut your calories more to lose faster? Do you, maybe you feel tired and hungry. Do you stabilize? Do you increase your calories? These are questions that can just boggle the mind. And if you're going by your own plan, you can start second guessing yourself. The RP Diet Coach app just takes all that guesswork out of your hands and says, hey, are you serious? You go, yes. You go, I really want results. Goes, do this and it'll get you results. Almost guaranteed if you follow the plan. So this is not, man, it's not a NIMBY PIMBY app that like talks about your feelings to you or all that other stuff. And if you're, if you're not pretty serious about your goals, and you want to just kind of eat a bunch of BS. Hey, listen, that's totally cool. There's times in life to do that. But if you're like, look, I, I want to lose fat or I want to gain muscle. I want a coach that tells me what to do. I'm not so interested in paying $200 a month for a nutrition coach. Maybe I don't have that kind of money right now. For 15 bucks a month, the RP diet coach can be your diet coach. And the only thing that is required of you is to bring the willpower. Unfortunately, that's something the diet coach cannot supply but if we figure out an app that increases your willpower, we sure will put up that update. <laughs> awesome. I mean, that's perfect. And, and to understand how that app comes together, that's where the next set of questions will lead to. Because So we have a gym, a location in, in Powerhouse Baseball Facility in Miami, and we reopen our facility of Blaze Camp and training. And we also have nutrition clients that need not – they use the RP diet app, but they need a reminder and a checkup. And sometimes people don't weigh in, they don't update their, you know, their weigh-ins. They, they don't know what to change some type of carb for what other carb that can fit their meal. And that's where we come in. And my wife does all the nutrition coaching where she'll sit down with the person, go over almost like a panel of, you know, emotions, stress, things that are going on in life, and then tailor the plan, the plan towards. It's really interesting. We learned that from RP diet is from the coaching app, we learned kind of like um, periodization of, you know, the, kind of the name says it, but hey, you should not be going into fat loss right now. You should be going into maintenance right now and then take them into a period of maintenance. And then, hey, look, it, you know, winter season's coming. You have a bunch of family. You're always telling me how much you're eating and going out. Let's go into a weight gain phase and let's train a little bit more. Let's get some mass going while we can take that opportunity. And then we'll go back into a fat loss phase after that. So people are having this, this roller coaster of, of emotions when they are on their own. 
And we're just going and putting them on a rail and being like, look, I understand that, that you want these results, but this is the way to get to those results. It's a right, it's not a left, it's a left, it's not a right. So it's been really amazing the amount of clients that we've gotten to be able to do that specific thing, periodize the people into a way of like how to use the app and move forward, right? Um, and moving forward is based on the results. So if the app is doing that for me and helping me and I have some type of guidance as far as information, now I want to ask a little bit more specific questions because we are in a baseball facility and we have, you know, like I told you before, we have boxers, we have track and field athletes. In this case, now we have baseball. And I'll start with them because it's really different than the average client in the gym. These are high school students, baseball players that have training um, in their school and they have in-gym training three to four times per week. A lot of the parents are coming in and saying they need to gain weight. They need to gain weight, obviously, because they want to transfer over to throwing harder, batting harder. So, yes, they're needing the in-gym stuff, but then they come to the gym and they can't really perform the weights. They can't really perform at the speed. They can't really perform certain things as going through a training session as, like, let's say, for example, a more mature adult, right? So yeah, we scale down the weight, we scale everything to where they can handle it. They don't have the aerobic capacity, so we're working on that. But then when we go over the eating part, it all broke down. So that's why I was like, Mike, we need to talk because I have to you know, get this out there. So the first question to you would be, for youth, they're not tracking anything. They're waking up, they're putting on two different set of socks, maybe even two different pairs of shoes. And they're just going and they're coming to the gym and they're like, I just woke up. They've dropped me off. I need to train. I'm like, did you eat anything? No. Did you eat last night? Yeah, I had a protein bar. Or yeah, I had a protein shake. They don't know what to do. So my question to you is, if you're thinking of a person that is an athlete, that is youth athlete, high school student, doesn't know what to get for breakfast, at around 5 a.m., 6 a.m., they'll be in gym training. Then they got to go to school. Then they got to go have lunch in school, get out of school, go to practice. How would you recommend the eating timing that they should be doing or they could be doing? Yes. Great, great question. I think an important thing for some of these folks may be to give them an idea of a few basic rules they can follow because their days are going to be different. Some days are this starts at six in the morning. Some days it starts at eight in the morning. Some days they have practice, some days they don't. So for folks of this age, I'm a little bit more into teaching them general rules and then offering them a more specific plan on top of that if they want one and more like, can they actually make use of one? But I, I, I shy away a little bit from just giving a plan because when you just give a plan, you have two problems. One, when the exact schedule isn't the schedule of the day, the plan is like incomprehensible. It goes completely out the window. The other thing is just telling them a plan prevents them from buying in as much as they could. When you give them a system of simple rules and describe why they need the rules, all of a sudden they get an internal understanding of, okay, I see why I'm doing this. And once you get an understanding, then you can make decisions based on no matter, on no matter what is going on, because you can adapt yourself uh, to the plan. So for example, if you are simply told how to say, let me get to the airport in Mandarin Chinese, but you find yourself in a place that speaks only Cantonese Chinese, you're not getting to the airport. It's a completely different language in many cases. Right. However, if, if you know a little bit about the Chinese language, but you know what the airport is and you know how to, you have to get there, you can be like me, you drive, and you can kind of airport, airport. And they're like, oh, airport, okay, great. They take you, you know, travel enough. And you know, like the language, understanding is universal. Language is not. Like so plane would be better. Like a hundred hundred percent. It uses some way for you pull up a YouTube video of the airport. Be like, take me there. Right. So 
at the end of the day, I think it's important to teach teens just a couple of real simple rules on nutrition. Now here's, this is part of the insight here. Just a couple of simple rules. Why? Because bro, real talk, teens don't have a bandwidth for a bunch of complex science-y crap. I mean, a few of them will, you know, people end up going to MIT and shit like that. But also, you know, even those kids, when they're 16, they don't care. It's, it, it, some of them do. It's just not a good idea to depend on their care. You got to just low common denominator. And the really awesome thing about sports nutrition is that the lowest common denominator handles like 80 or 90% of the success that you're going to have. So, you know, it's kind of like if you goal is to teach people how to drive from point A to point B, if they could just move the steering wheel and brake some gas and know how to fill gas in their car and stop at stoplights, man, they, you know, they're pretty good. We're not trying to train Formula One drivers here. Right. So right. The, a couple of simple rules is as follows. Almost every meal, as many meals as you can, are built around a high quality protein source. And you just give them a few examples. Lean meats, lean dairy products, skim milk, uh, et cetera, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, eggs, and by meats, I mean poultry, fish, everything like that. You know, if they're vegan or whatever, lean vegan products and protein bars and protein shakes. And, and Quick go, question on that. Mm-hmm. The eggs is really common. And parents will tell me, hey, I made I made them eggs. And this is a 17-year-old, 170 pounds. And they're like, how many eggs did you make? And, well, he eats one to two eggs. Right. Yes. No, right? Like- right. The amount matters. So you tell them. I want you to have as much protein as is like the size of your fist or even a little more in every single meal. That's two protein bars. That's eight eggs. That's, you know, whoops, big ten, eight, 10 ounce slab of lean protein. It's serious. You're an athlete. You need to be eating serious food. In addition to that, most of your meals, you should also try to get something like a veggie, any kind of green veggie that you like. A little handful of that, sometimes a f- some a pieces of some pieces of fruit, and uh, in many cases whole grains, like a you know, whole grain bread, pasta, rice, etc. Now those are sort of interchangeable. It's not you don't have to have all three, but most meals should have some of it. Not all meals, but most. And then on top of that, you try to get them to choose kind of healthy fat sources. And you just go through as nut, nut butters, and olive oil, canola oil, you know, healthy oils. And, you know, avocado. And that's just a pretty short list. So you get them just understand these short lists of proteins, that all the meals are built around protein. Optional are carbs and fats. If they need more energy, they eat more carbs. If they want to stay for a fuller for longer, they eat more veggies. If they want to gain more weight, they eat more carbs and more fats, healthy fats, ideally. And you tell us that's rule one is like, eat like that for every meal. And rule two is try to have like, four roughly evenly spread meals per day. And if you eat nothing else, at least four core sources of protein per day, which means if you wake up and you got to go train soon, you might not be eating a whole breakfast, right? Have two protein bars after training. You may be too busy to do whatever, have a big bowl of cereal with a bunch of skim milk and down a protein shake during lunch. You know, when they have like chicken breast or fish or something at lunch or some cheeseburgers have two of them shits. And then, you know, after school, before practice, maybe in your last school period, have another couple protein bars or pack a few sandwiches and eat those. After practice, you know, when you get home and mom makes you a big hearty meal, take a couple extra servings of of lean meat for yourself, a bunch of grains. And if you're hungry later at night, have a few cookies and have a big glass of, of, of milk along with that. So when you're feeding them plenty of food and they're not hungry, and you're making sure to hit it evenly spread four-ish times a day, four or five. And each one has protein. Man, for developing young baseball players, that's damn near the only thing you need. Micronutrients, blob, vitamins, minerals. None of those kids are deficient in any of that stuff. And they'll get cravings if they do. They'll be like, man, I feel like eating like three oranges. Great. Vitamin C filled up. And if you just get them to eat a multivitamin every morning, that handles that anyway. So just that core understanding four or five roughly evenly spread high protein meals per day of pretty healthy food, man, that's it. And they'll ask you for a while, like examples, they'll be like, Hey, I had a turkey sandwich. Is that good? You'd be like, yeah, did I have a crap load of turkey? They're just a little bit. We'll have two of them next time or double layer the turkey. 
go to Subway and get you a foot long with extra meat instead of just a six inch with regular meat, you know? And they'll say, well, can I have chips or can I have candy? And the answer to that is actually really simple. You say, if you get through your real good for you athlete food and you're still hungry, yeah, have chips and candy, no worries. But if you can't get through your real food and you're having chips and candy instead, is that okay? Sometimes. But then I like to drop this on real athletes, especially young athletes. Be like, hey man, where do you see your baseball taken? And everyone almost, almost everyone says the same thing. The league. You know, I want to play in the MLB. They're like, I got you. You ever see an MLB player play, catch, throw, hit? Most of them would be like, yeah. They'd be like, are they impressive? They'd be like, dude, they're out of this world. I got you. So you're trying to build yourself into an out of this world machine. And they're like, well, yeah, like I got you. Do you think machines eat what they like, like Skittles and shit they feel like? Or do you think they eat like fuel, like athletes, like warriors? And they're like, well, yeah, fuel. Like, okay, shut up and go eat that shit. Because a lot of times you just need to real talk some young ass little kids about like, look, man, you do not simply float your way into being Barry Bonds. You can, if you have Barry Bonds genetics, how many of us have that? You want to bet on that? I don't want to bet on that. League contracts, we're going to pay millions of dollars. I'm not gambling millions of dollars being like, ah, I think I have good enough genetics to not worry about nutrition. You want to give yourself every single advantage possible. Right. And it's very common that the leagues will, at the minor league levels, they'll send athletes. I have a couple now. They'll send them, you know, in their off season and be like, you need to gain muscle mass. Yeah. And then they're on, you know, hey, I need to gain muscle mass. It's like, all right, when, when do you get back? How long are you going to train? Well, four weeks. What? So, all right, I'll, we'll do our best, but you better be eating whatever yeah. it is you need to be eating. And we'll accumulate it over years, probably. Yeah. You know? yeah. Now, this isn't something to worry about in high school. But if you're listening to this or if you've got a kid in high school and they're doing baseball and they're trying to be serious, check this out. If you're in the minor league and you get sent home with instructions on how to get better, there is a 100% chance that the coach is not sufficiently impressed with you to push you up to the next level. They don't tell Barry Bonds, go home and get better. They tell him, go home and get your parents to co-sign this contract so you get to play in the MLB, <laughs> right? You already, if you are too skinny for the big leagues and you're in the minor leagues, you know how it works in coaching. Like you get a look at an athlete as a coach and you get a feel for an athlete. And the feel is one of two things. That kid's a champion or that kid needs work and he's not a champion yet. And coaches have a perception, the human, right? You don't want to give them too many ticks on that side of the board that says needs help, needs improvement, needs help, needs improvement. Yes, improvement is great. Yes, we all get there at some point in many cases. And there's nothing wrong with working on yourself if you have flaws. But you, if you can remediate most of those flaws in high school, you arrive to college baseball or to the minor leagues impressing some folks you want to impress those people i promise you and you want to impress high school recruiters you want to impress everyone so it's not a matter of like well you know i'm 16 17 i'm just working on my baseball game eventually i'll gain weight and that'll be fine uh that's okay if you want to be okay yeah. Yeah. and if you say look it's not that important i like hanging out with my friends i like to do school work hey amazing bro i never want to play baseball at the next level. I played baseball at no level. I hung out with my friends and did schoolwork. But, but if you want to be at that top tier, you got to understand and no pressure, just calm, relaxed, doing a bit more of the right shit. And some of that right shit means eating those good, high quality meals, putting yourself to work in the weight room consistently, because at some point you are going to get to that next level, hopefully. And imagine getting to the minor leagues and the coach is walking around looking at you guys in practice and he, like some kid next to you, he's like, Jesus Christ, kid, what are you from Somalia? You got to gain weight. Get out of here. Just, just kidding around with him. But you know, it's that little flow jab, you yeah. know? And he looks at you and he's like, good God, we need to drug test this man. Look at this Jack. He's like an adult human being already. Like, you want to hear that. And you can hear that if you yeah. just do a little bit of the right stuff and gain an extra 20 pounds. I mean, you give me a baseball player that's 170, in some positions, I'm like, eh, all right. You give me a guy that's 190, and I'm like, yo, okay. They watch you hit, you hit, and that ball makes a different sound on that bat. And coaches know that sound. They go, what the hell is that? What was the velocity on that? Oh, okay, that kid's got potential. And if you're rough around the edges and technique or something, that they can fix. If you're 30 pounds underweight, I don't know, man. I, they can't fix it and you can hear it you know when i tell students throw a medicine ball against the wall there's some kids that i don't want to be between them and the wall yes. some other kids i'm like listen 
you need to, <laughs> you know, all right, we'll talk. Are you trying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Like the ball will throw them. That's the other way around. <laughs> yeah, that's so, right. So, all right. So here's, so it, it goes from here. The, they're trying to grow. Um, just two specific questions about what you said, just to make sure that I clear that for the people that are listening. One, I get a lot of the, um, hey, what about the cholesterol on the eggs? So real quick, what is your take on that? Yeah, two things. One, cholesterol from the diet has almost no effect on the cholesterol in your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Two different concepts. Um, another thing is that they've studied the direct impact of things like egg consumption on health. And overall, there's essentially no correlation or the correlation is positive such that people who consume a few whole eggs per day, even a few more than a, whole, uh, a few, and engage in regular physical activity and are young and otherwise healthy, tend to be healthier than people that don't. So there's nothing wrong with some eggs. Now, here's the thing. If you smoke cigarettes and you're a truck driver and you eat a 16 egg full yolk omelet with cheese and sour cream on that ish, every day, yes, eggs are poorly related to your blood cholesterol and everything else. But unless you have a genetic predisposition for having really high cholesterol, which if you do, that's between you and your doctor and you need to handle that. Most people don't, then you're totally good to go. It's interesting how some of the pretty decent population level advice that we get from bodies like the USDA and the FDA, they're filtered down and people think they sort of apply to everyone. The thing is like a like, you know, Dominican American 17 year old baseball player is not who they're targeting with that advice, bro. They're, right. tar they're targeting Kansas City resident, 360 pound truck driver, white dude, whose cholesterol is a trillion and he's going to die really soon unless he just eliminates some bad stuff from his diet. Got it's it. too different. It's like, you know, if you look at Lance Armstrong's diet, like when he's training for winning bike races, pancakes, cereal, rice, pizza, he eats pizza on the bike. No joke. They eat pizza right on the bike. Um, is that a good diet to have if you're a regular dude working at like UPS? No, you're going to die of cardiovascular disease in like a day and a half, but it's two different things. Athletes need something different. And most of them, eggs are totally fine. Cholesterol is fine. Red meat is fine. All that stuff is totally good to go. And in fact, quite good for you. Yeah, that was red meat leads me to the next question. So I have a lot of parents that you can guess it with their kids trying to gain weight. Um, and you know, this, again, this ties into general population. They want to gain weight and the dad says, or the mom says, I'm giving them creatine. I bought the creatine and I bought the mass gainer. And I, I usually ask, okay, we, what's happening with the mass gainer? Well, he gets stomach aches and then he can't take it all the time here or there. And I'm like, well, the mass gainer to me, what I've seen in ingredients it's not something very um, easy on the stomach. And it, to, uh, to my knowledge, I don't know the details, but to my knowledge, there's a lot of extra stuff on the max gainer that doesn't really sit well on my stomach. And most of the clients that I've had that are gaining weight that use a mass gainer eventually just get a bunch of stomach issues and they just can't you know, blend with it. But then again, we could maybe just have some type of weakness. But what is your thoughts on giving a high school student a thousand calorie mass gainer that you, you know what I'm talking about. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. So the mass gainer is interesting because I have a funny story about mass gainer. I had a, a very good friend, my best friend at the time, uh, still it's a great person. Um, his name is Dave and him and I were trying to get jacked in high school and he bought mass gainer and he used the instructions that, cause there's two kinds of instructions on that, on the side of that. One is like for regular results and the other one's like for extreme results and no joke. For mutant performance. Mutant. <laughs> That's right. So the extreme results one was like mass gainer, blend, add whole milk, blend, add ice cream, blend. And it was like 2,800 calories. He downed it all in one gulp after a workout. 30 minutes later, he just threw up and it was all gone. And they were like, oh man. I guess the human body can only absorb so much food at one time. And if you overwhelm a 15 year old stomach, they're just going to be like, I can't do this. So most mass gainers sit just fine with most people. Now caveat here, if it doesn't sit well in your stomach, even with the modifications I'm about to give, don't use it. It's not magical. And that's the biggest thing about mass gainers. It's just food. It's food in powdered form that you can drink. 
period. So it's not like, oh, mass gain, because people think mass gainers are like some magical thing that like will multiply your results. Like, no, a cheeseburger is a mass gainer if you blend it and flavor it like chocolate or something like that. Wow. So mass gainers are totally fine, but you should mix them with water instead of milk. And you should, for a young person, start with like half the recommended serving and have it post-workout. And if that sits well with your stomach, amazing. It's a checklist for one of your meals for the day, not all your meals. And you're, so if your mass gainer doesn't sit well with you, you don't have to use it. You're missing out on nothing. If your mass gainer sits well with you, start with a little bit. And if you tolerate it just fine, you can increase a little bit. If you tolerate it just fine, but you're nice and full, that's it. That's all you ever need out of it. Another thing, this is a real big point that maybe you've seen with your athletes. I saw them, tons of athletes all the time. Because people think that mass gainer is this like secret ingredient that it sort of powers the whole equation that they take it, it relieves their concern about eating well for all the other meals. Right. What they'll, they'll just eat like nonsense for all the other meals or skip meals. And the thing is like, if you normally eat 800 uh, calorie meals, and that means, you know, over two meals, you have 1600 calories. If you eat a thousand calorie mass gainer in one meal, all right, sweet. But then you're like, hey, I'm on mass gainer. Woo. And then you go have PlayStation party with your friends after practice for a couple hours. Not wrong with that. You miss a meal completely. You are down 600 total calories for what you're supposed to be eating that day. And, and right. the mass gainer, because it does nothing special, is just kind of like, okay. It's like mass gainer is kind of like, uh, you know, let's say, let's take a, like a meal, like, like a, like a, like a, uh, this is a terrible analogy. We'll see if it holds up. Uh, like a, 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 if, if a day's worth of eating is like a brawl, right. And the meals are like guys you bring on your crew to fight other, other people with, you know, regular meals are like one meal is like one of your buddies that can scrap. A mass gainer is just another one of your buddies that can scrap. And if you're like, bro, I'm about to show up to your hood with my boy, he can scrap that's mass gainer. And the other guy brings four of his friends, all normal meals. You can be like, how good is your boy at scrapping? Like, oh man, he's not that good. Right. <laughs> a, a, a mass gainer is not a pro boxer. It'll just be like, bloop, 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 knock yeah. everyone out. And that's it. It's yeah. just another meal. And then if you take mass gainer, just check it as a meal and you still have to eat that next meal. It's an easy way to take in food. It's a quick way to take in food. Some people don't like to eat solid food after a big workout. If a mass gainer does the trick, a lot of times it's lower in fat, higher in carbs and protein. It can be easier on the stomach. But I'll tell you this, if mass gainer for you is harder on your stomach than regular food, there's zero reasons to have a mass gainer. It's just excluded itself completely out of the equation whatsoever. So yeah. that's the thing with mass gainers. You mentioned creatine. Creatine's cool. It works. You have to take it every day for months on end for it to do something, it'll gain you a little bit of weight, like five pounds of body water. And then it just kind of keeps that constant. It enhances, it's a little bit magic, right? But it's kind of like a little bit of Nas on your car. Like right. if you show up to a street race with a, a, like a regular unmodified Honda Civic and you're like, I got Nas baby. Someone's going to pull up in a stock Mustang and be like, okay, and just beat you. And you're going to be like, but I have Nas, that's, right? That's the biggest thing that I've tried to explain to athletes. So like if a mass gainer can be fair life chocolate milk with two scoops of protein and add a banana and you've got calories, they taste delicious, it's lactose free, it's going to be great on your stomach. You can not worry about the pimples as much because it's, it's a little bit different. You know, I don't know. That's what I use, you know, usually sure. see in the gym. And sure. then the creatine, I tell them that I tell them it doesn't matter if you take creatine, but you're still not fit enough. Yeah. So yeah, you just started the gym and you took the 10 grams of creatine to load up on your first week every day. And you're taking it religiously with your orange juice. Awesome. But yeah, did you do your cardio? Did you do the lifting? Did you do everything else that we're trying to yes. get you to prepare so that that magic can actually happen. If you didn't, then we're going to have to go back. And yeah, you're putting NAS on a Honda Civic from 93. And then right. you're reaching now with a Tesla. You can't race the Tesla. They are going to the MLB. <laughs> the staff is already looking at them. They're not right. calling you or emailing you back, you know? Right, 100%. And, you know, it's also like, is creatine a part of the arsenal of the advanced athlete? Yes. 
But like you said, they got all that other stuff under the hood. And if you want to be at that level, you got to build yourself into being that fast car. So like, if you tell me you take creatine, but you're running a Honda Civic for the rest of your nutrition, 93. I'm asked, 93, that's a good year. That's a, that's a vintage <laughs> Honda Civic. So if, if you say that, and the shit is rusted, and one of the wheel caps is off, I'm trying to be like, yo, are you saving up your money to get that V8? Are you saving up your money to get at least like a 98 Mustang like that you can modify? And you're like, nah, nah, I got creatine. I got knobs. You know, like, really, bro? That's it's just not going to take you far. But then also, like, you get this fascination with creatine. Imagine asking, like, like a, I was going to say professional, but this is essentially illegal. Like, like a midnight club type of like, like uh, you know, like midnight dragster kind of guy who has, let's say, like, like a skyline, highly modded, 1500 horse, like psychotic shit. And you're like, hey, man, like, do you have Nas? He's going to be like, yeah. And he's like, that's crazy. But like, it's not as crazy as my 1500 horsepower engine, like, and my custom wheels and my custom steering wheel. And like, there's 18 other more important things to go in that car than Nas. And that's the real thing people miss. Now, if you see enough Vin Diesel movies, and there's something special to when they flip the switch and go, and it hits the Nas. Yes, it's sexy, but it hits the Nas to take you from 160 to 180. You got to get to 160 on your own before the Nas makes a difference. You, if you hit the Nas from the start line, you go from zero to 20. Okay, like now you're going as fast as a bike. Who cares? Yeah. And here's where I bring this back around. If you take creatine, but you're slacking on your lifting, you're slacking on your eating, you're going as fast as a bicycle. <laughs> Slow clap. Amazing. You're on your way. The league already been calling you, man. Check home with your moms. She's been yeah. fielding calls. Hey, I heard your son was taking creatine. Can we get a little practice? See him throw the ball a bit? Yeah. Get out of here. You need to tweet that as soon as I <laughs> post it. If I'm you... not on Twitter. Tweet it for me. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Listen, Elon. Um, so what we're going to do is, it, so if we take that and then we, we're, the athlete is getting built and all that, um, I don't want to take the route of, you know, there's parents and people and, and coaches that talk about adding, you know, hormones to the kids. And I, I, I don't, do Holy crap. I don't try to like worry about that, but there is people out there that are doing that and they're pushing past They're you know, they're trying to buy a new car and it's just, that's the car you have. So that's, that's something with kids. It becomes really messy uh, with adults. They, they can do whatever they want. And, and as long as they're organized and they're legit with it, then I think they're totally fine. But uh, there's also that factor. There's going to be um, kids and, and students younger that, that are doing illegal things and they might be doing it in other countries and then coming over here to train and things like that, which I've seen. Um, do you still, even with some enhancements going on in the car, in the person, in the kid, in the student, do you still believe that nutrition and training has to be the primary to that before? Or what do you see that, um, that because it's a touchy subject, but it's real, you know? All right. I'm going to keep the shit as real as possible. When you take hormonal enhancements as a teenager, it can have permanent effects on the development of your brain making you permanently less than the ideal adult human being in sexual ways, in mental ways, in intelligence, in all kinds of crazy stuff, in hormonal function, it's a bad deal. It can stunt your growth and often will physically become less tall than you could have. Many males, especially athletically gifted males, don't reach their peak height until they're 22 years old. If you use hormones before then, you may not reach peak height. I'm no baseball fan, but I think height kind of matters, bro. I mean, I'm five, six. I'm not playing any baseball. You know, you see the average MLB pitcher is like six, seven or something completely insane. And there's not a whole lot of positions in baseball in which like, sorry, Jim, you're too tall for this position. That, that doesn't happen too right. short. Yeah, that'll happen all the time. So you got to think about like, do you want to be a stud high school player by using steroids in high school? Or do you want to be a guy that ends up in the league by playing the long game? So that's a big thing to consider. It's like a short, it's the ultimate shortcut to not that far ahead, first of all. Second of all, anyone who takes enhancements and is ultra serious about it, let's say as an adult in baseball, in a league they, that it's okay for you to take enhancements, then it's going to be a decision between adults and it's going to be in, the, in a very exotic environment of I'm doing this crazy thing to my body that's harming my health, it's reducing how long I live, it's making me have these crazy side effects. 
if I don't put the rest of my nutrition and training together like a machine, why in God's name am I doing it? Like, what the hell for? It's a huge expense. It's like getting a weapon at home in your in your in your car or your house, let's say under your under your couch for self defense. And you're like, yeah, I got ten thousand dollar optics on it. Like, what are you hunting the predator for some shit? Like, what is going on here? And again, I don't ever use it. But like, okay, you're an idiot. You could have bought three other guns and hit him in other closets for that much money. Three, twenty other guns, and you'd be that much safer, right? It's all home defense. Like, you don't need optics at all. You can just shoot in one direction with a shotgun, and that's it. Why so did you put four Nas bottles on the Civic? <laughs> that's it, exactly. I just hit, hit the next Nas. The engine is not even on. It's just Nas the whole way. So it's just kind of like really, really short sighted. So, yeah. the, and here's another thing I'll add to that equation. The thing that really gets you to the league is genetics and you either have it or you don't. The thing that also really gets you to the league is years of training and you either put it in or you don't. The thing on top of that that also gets you to the league is years of proper nutrition and getting as muscular and lean as you need to be to compete at that level. The enhancements, the illegal stuff, some people choose to use that as a cherry on top. But yeah, if the league, it might matter. You know what I'm saying? I believe Mark McGuire was as drug-free as the next guy, which is to say not at all. But Mark McGuire wasn't a 17-year-old that took steroids and turned into Mark McGuire. He was enormous and strong at 17, 18, 19 from amazing genetics, amazing work ethic, amazing nutrition. And he just kept doing that for years. And then at the end, that little cherry on top may have made the difference. It is, it's like another example of Nas. It will let you go further, but it putters out real quick. And just like Nas can burn out your engine if you overuse it, this can really burn you out if you overuse it. So if yeah. you're young, you could be, here's the thing they don't tell you. If you are young and you're considering taking this illegal shit, put people around you, maybe pushing it on you. Think about this. You could be the person that takes it and you get jacked, strong, better at baseball. You end up in the league. You end up a millionaire. You're A-Rod. Amazing. You could be a person who works at Walmart in five years. And yo, can I swear on this? This shit is okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Your dick doesn't work anymore and fucking never will without pills because you blew that shit out taking steroids. That happens, by the way, quite frequently. Now, let me ask you a question. How many people ratio-wise turn into A-Rod? versus guy at Walmart whose dick doesn't work. It's like a thousand to one, bro. Or so, more. Or, more. or more. And here's what else you could do. If you think you have that level to go to the league and make big bucks, you will nine trillion, nine, 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 nine out of 10 trillion, whatever times, be able to, with your own raw genetics and hard work with no drugs, make it to the minors or top co college play and be scouted for the league. Because if you need steroids to get to the major league, you're going to be at the bottom of a very big, talented pool of guys who are either just genetically straight up better than you, worked harder than you, or all that shit, and they're using steroids, right? So you don't want to be, because, you know, MLB playing pro ball is an impressive thing unless you're like the worst player in the league. Then what happens? You get to go to training camp. They see you play. Technically, you have a contract for a year. They sideline you the whole time. After a year, they clip your contract. You're out. And what are you doing? Yeah. Dickless at Walmart again, right? So yeah. you got you got to think about long term stuff. Like you know, uh, here's an ex here's another example. Uh, how it's especially back in the day. Nowadays, it's safer. Space travel. Okay, going to space, sitting a human being into like space shuttle Challenger, and rocketing them up into space. Yo, that shit is dangerous as hell. There must be something real compelling with a high probability of success that you need up there in space. Most people, like people ask me like, hey, like space travel, would you do it? I'm like, hell no, motherfucker, that shit is dangerous as hell. And like, if it was safe, I'd go, but there's nothing I need in space that makes me want to risk my life. So if you want to take steroids and all that shit, you have had better have good reason to do it. And good reason automatically comes back to being like you're already so good that you're going to make the minors anyway that you're going to make the league anyway so my, my thought on that is if you are already 23 years old and you're in the minors at the very cusp and you're morally okay with cheating whatever that's between you and god you can take steroids to get to the majors all right sweet you've good luck sleeping at night 
if you're in the majors and you need to compete with other guys that are cheating and you need to take steroids, hey, listen, you know, I'm going to judge you, but who am I? Whatever. That's between you and God. But if you're in high school and you're using steroids to try to get to where the minors, yeah. what are you going to pull out of your rabbit out of a hat? Where? Can you imagine like you, you meet a kid in the minors on the bus over and you're like, yeah, man, I'm on this whole cycle to get here, blah, blah. And I pitch, you know, 85 miles an hour. He's like, sweet. I pitch 87 miles an hour. I've never taken a drug in my life. You're like, holy shit. Am I an idiot that I just on their way up? They're on their way up and they got years to go and you got nothing. So think it through. Let, let the shit mature under the hood. Don't rush into this stuff. And remember, it's not is the results are super impressive on occasion, but they just won't take you all the way. You need to get your own natural shit established, become an adult first well into your 20s and then it's some shit to maybe consider based on the situation you're in but but uh, here's another really quick thing because this is a big deal right yeah some people will not have your best interests in mind right some of your coaches what is helpful to them is that you win at their level so they get to be recognized florida high school coach of the year they'll use you they'll pump you full of drugs so that you're the best at their level they don't really care if by the time you get to the minors you your dick doesn't work and your brain is all fucked up and you peter out and turn it into nothing They don't care about that as much because they still got their rings. So think about, is a coach interested in your long-term or in your short-term? Because if they're interested in long-term, they'll usually tell you, stay away from that shit. You don't need it yet. That's shit for adults. Don't worry. But if they're in the short-term, they're like, hey, here's these pills so we can win states. If somebody tells you that shit, you got to watch Varsity Blues again, motherfucker, and give that shit some thought. You know what I'm saying? You're old enough to get that joke. Yeah, I I think our old movies teach us so much. Like, (laughs) in the Furious, you know, like, he pulled the miles way too early. Too early. <laughs> like that was the first race. That was the first thing that we learned. Like that's it. Experience. So the the that question now transitions over to the exact same thing in bodybuilding. Do you see that specific same scenario in bodybuilding where the mass gainer, the creatine, you know, and the enhancements become the magical factor that people want to add on before putting the amount of work in nutrition and training do you often see that a lot or you not see it as much in your in the sport that you normally see most athletes all the time and about the same as before in my in my view one of the reasons that it's not worse is because kids nowadays are smarter. They have more access to good information. You could just go on YouTube and find out what anyone thinks and be like, oh, I'm glad I'm not an idiot and just decide to do this. Right. That's the plus side. On the minus side, there is more of a short-term exposure culture. So for example, back in the 90s, you knew that until you were going to become really, really jacked, you weren't going to be shit anyway. No one's going to hear of you. You're not going to make it to the magazines if you're just like a jack 200 pounds. You'd be a jack 250 And people sort of knew like, okay, I got to put in my work with diet anyway, because I'm not just going to drug myself all the way up to it. Maybe I'll go from 180 to 200, but I still got to eat to get to 250. I might as well eat to get to 230, go from 230 to 50 on drugs, and then I'll be in the magazines or whatever. Nowadays, you got TikTok, you know what I'm saying, Snapchat, Instagram, Fox Wipe, whatever you're using, and you have this instant kind of recognition. And there's this whole culture of like putting your age by your shit, and you're like, no, 18 years old like who gives a shit motherfucker like are we supposed to be impressed that you're so young and so jacked first of all you're not that jacked second of all no one cares how old you are i want to see if you become shit the only reason that people think being young and jacked is impressive is because they extrapolate in their minds imagine how jacked he'll be later he's not going to be jacked later he's going to have like gone through steroid rehab and reorganized his life he's going to be a good christian he's going to have a happy home and he's going to weigh 180 pounds just train for fun i know 10 guys like that to every person i know who turned pro they washed out of that whole stupid lifestyle so the thing is that's tempting to be like a tiktok teenage star and take all these drugs and it leads you to be you know as impressive as the average tiktok guy what you monetize in reels that much that <laughs> like no you're not nobody cares it's easy to get caught in that rat race and so many people fall prey to that they turn to creatine they turn to mass gainers luckily those things aren't terrible for your health at all so you're good to go with those it's just going to be disappointing if you don't have your big nutrition or you know priority set in motion and don't have high quality training a lot of them turn to steroids and that's really really bad and usually ends up having them go nowhere 
and, and there are definitely counterexamples. Some people start steroids young. Genetically, they have no real bad reactions to them. They end up being pros. They talk about their journey. And you're like, see, look, what's his name started at 17? Yes. And that is an example of something in statistics called survivorship bias. You only see the famous guys, motherfucker. Go to your gym. Go to Walmart. Talk to Jim, who is no longer muscular, doesn't train. Dick doesn't work because he made all the wrong choices when he was younger. That guy's not in the magazine. That guy's not on TikTok. But there's a hundred of those motherfuckers to one of these other people. And if you don't get with that reality, you're going to have a hard time dealing with the shit that you're like. It's almost like going to the casino to make a living because you uh, you think like, well, I've seen all these winners. Like, bro, on average, people lose. And that's the thing. On average, the average steroid user is someone you can't even pick out of a crowd. I'll never forget this. Uh, real talk. I was uh, 28 years old. I was finishing my PhD program. I had been training for 13 years or something. And I had recently started uh, using uh, steroids. And I was like 225 with veins and shit like that at 5'6". I chatted with the guy. He came up to me. He was 5'7", barely taller than me, 160, no definition. And he was again, man, that trend's hitting me real hard. I'm like, motherfucker, where, does it, where did it go? Do you shoot the needle into the sky and think it? Did you miss your, I don't understand, but like, bro, that's the average steroid, right? Like, what are you doing? So, so it's, it's just like, it's not magic and you have to be a good responder to it. There's tons of downsides. So to be sure that you're doing the shit, right? Here's the formula until you're about 25, put in the hard work of training. Cause that never goes away. Training on steroids is even harder because you can push your body so much further. It gets really scary and super intense. Um, train yourself hard, do the right dieting. Sure. You can take mass gainer, but you better be eating them meals too. Sure. You can take creatine, but you better be eating them meals too. gain naturally until you're 25 or even older. See how you look. If by the end of that journey, you weigh 170, don't use steroids because there's nothing you're going to take. That's going to make you big Rami. If by the end of that journey, you're 220, 230, 250, Hey, you might have what it takes to be a real contender. Then the decision is up to you because you're a grown up adult. There's no harm in your development anymore. You're done through that phase. Then you can consider the shit. But, and, the, and here's the thing, you don't miss out on anything. You just like building the cake and then getting the icing. But if you make a cake and it turns out to be a shitty pancake and it's crusty and burnt, that's how somehow people's genetics are with muscle gain. Yeah. Don't do it. Like, for example, like what's you and I's, I don't mean to offend you or anything, but what's you and I's genetics for endurance sport? Like if you tried to become elite cyclists, could you imagine, bro, you and I were living close to each other and we'd be like, dude, let's do this tour de France, 2027 or death, this bump. Be like, all right, put me on EPO, testosterone. Be like, at the end of the month, we're like riding the worst type. Like it was women passing us in the fucking park on their bikes. Like, why did we even bother with all these crazy drugs? See what your body can do naturally first. And if you at that level, maybe the choice is yours. So one of my uh, best friends, Jared Feather, he's now an IFBB pro bodybuilder. I told him when we met, he was in his early 20s. I said, the smart thing for you to do is not get on anything until you're 25 years old. And until you are, you have basically 200 pounds of lean body mass or close. And that's a big boy. And he did it. And then when he hopped on, he gained 25 pounds of muscle in the first year. But that's elite, ultra elite genetics. And he put in the basic work to get ultra. Everyone thought he was on steroids before he even got on steroids. Most of those people shut up after the first year he gained 25 pounds. They're like, oh, well, if he's already on, how did that happen? Right? So that's how that worked. That's an almost ideal example of that. But you want to make sure you get to that point before, you know, you want to make sure you have a V8 before you put the Nas on the shit. If you've been training your car, training your body for 10 years, and you still have a Honda Civic, don't buy the Nas. Just go to the store and get groceries and come back and spend time with your wife. That's what your car is for. It's not a race car. So the, ba the basic thing that what I'm hearing is you're going to have to build the chassis. You're going to have to build the car. Anyway. If, yeah. If, if you, I don't know if you've seen the movie Ford versus Ferrari. Yes. I use that a lot. From what you're saying, it just it just really resonates with me because I tell people, listen, they never had a big problem with the engine. They had a problem with the brakes. They had a problem with the suspension. They had a problem with other things that weren't the engine. And usually, yeah, strength and conditioning coaches, nutrition coaches, they want to build the biggest engine 
because they can promote the bigger engine. And that's what people relate the most to horsepower and speed and getting there faster. But they forget that there's a whole engineering team just for the suspension system, just for the brakes, just to have to create a new brake system as it is from scratch. Because that the one they had as far as technology, it didn't work for the speed and power that this car was putting out. So what I'm listening to you saying is, is, is kind of relates to that. Like, listen, you need to build the car that can sustain the engine. The engine mm -hmm. is built simultaneously throughout everything else as well. So as much as the skill of the driver is the, the hydraulics and the suspensions and whatever you need for the vehicle, for the sport, if it's a, it doesn't matter if it's a big wheel, if it's a truck, if it's a car, whatever you're doing has different systems. One that can do the power, one that can do the steering, you know, and all kinds of factors. Mm -hmm. But let's, and if we take that, over directly into the last sport that I, that I usually want to talk about is um, CrossFit. So in CrossFit, the demand of, of the demand of cardiovascular output and intensity is a little bit higher than let's say baseball training and let's say bodybuilding as far as heart rate goes, not, you know, not systemic fatigue because you can have systemic fatigue on bodybuilding just as much as you can have like let's say on crossfit with a good training program assuming the program mm -hmm. is progressive but in the training session in itself is a smaller time frame higher intensity for most of the common crossfit wads let's say if somebody was trying to gain muscle mass and cut body fat while they're in crossfit crossfit style training cross training where you would have that weight lifting and all that. And, you know, mass gainer, creatine, and let's say we take away the enhancers, right? These guys are natural. It's paleo style, it's OG CrossFit, the good style, like the, the, you know, the, the good, right? The quote unquote good. Cause now it's a little bit messy and where CrossFit is going. But as far as like, sure. what and the culture where it came from was lower carbohydrates, higher proteins, you know, low seeds, nuts, whatever. They had a, a saying on how they did it. But what do you think would be a good option for people to think? Because I saw your video on multiply your body weight times 16.5. And that would be a an average amount of calories that you can intake to maintain your or to gain muscle mass. Yes. Right? So about point quarter, point half of a percent per week. Um, is that a formula that they can use even in CrossFit or any other sport to grow muscle mass? What do you think about that in that context of sport? Yes, I have about four minutes left total, yeah, but I will try to answer this. No worries. I'll try to answer as best I can. I think it's plenty of time. First of all, that formula is totally fine as a baseline to start. After a week, if you haven't gained any mass or enough mass, you got to eat more. And it's time to add another 250, even 500 more calories evaluate after another week and go from there. Second thing, when you're gaining weight, if you're very serious about it, can you do your CrossFit wads? Yes. Can you and should you do extra aerobic work on top of that? Probably not because you're making weight gain harder. Should you do some extra resistance training, some bodybuilding work? Probably. Because CrossFit wads are kind of hit or miss on if they supply your muscles with a big enough stimulus to grow a lot of muscle mass. Right. Some of them are awesome full body resistance workouts. Some of them are like just kind of interesting fitness characteristics that, you know, like some of them are like, you know, sprint 400 meters and do a couple push ups. It's like, oh, geez, that's not really whole body. And that's not really a hypertrophy stimulus. Whereas other ones will be like crap load of ring pull ups, ring dips, and squats. And it's like, okay, that's pretty good. So I would say supplement your crossfitting with another two days to three days of kind of more bodybuilding work properly to, 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 to be done after every single wad that you do and start at 16.5 times your body weight and calories and work up or down from there based on how your body responds. Because CrossFitters sometimes expend a lot more energy than the average person. Sometimes they expend less. A lot of it comes down to individual metabolism and, and all that other stuff where some people can gain, gain, gain off of 13 times their body weight or whatever. Some people, you can take them to 18 and they're still losing. So it's all about starting with a baseline and then going up from there as needed. And that extra bodybuilding work can go a long way. You don't want to necessarily rely just on the CrossFit training to make you more jacked. CrossFit is a sport in and of its own right. And it's not the best hypertrophic stimulus. 
just like you wouldn't ever be like, hey, you play baseball, and you want to gain weight, just eat more food and let your baseball training build muscle. It's nonsense. That doesn't build that much muscle. You need weights. So sometimes CrossFitters need a few more weight sessions a week as well. All right. That's perfect. Thank you, Doc. I appreciate your time. I appreciate everything that you do. You have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. And again, uh, what's the website? Renaissance Periodization, or if you just can't spell like me, you just go to YouTube and type in RP Strength and Dr. Mike, and it'll all come up links all the way through. I'll link it either way on the video and on the podcast. Thank you, Doc. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.